Lars, we're back. I'm starstruck. Uh, I, I told you I wouldn't be, but here I am. I'm like my younger self excited. <laughs> Dustin Rhodes is joining us. Lars, I know before we talked about how we're going to try to maintain our coolness. I'm not going to do it. I lied to you. Well, you know what? I mean, what's there to say? Let's just jump right in there. I mean, I, you know, let's get going. Well, Dustin, thank you so much for hanging out with us. Uh, we truly appreciate it. We're both massive fans of yours, and uh, we're really excited to hit you with a bunch of nerdy questions today. Sounds good to me, and I'm a big fan of y'all, too. Thank you very much. Oh, I appreciate thank you. It. So, listen, I'm going to start out uh, with just kind of the nerdiest aspect of, of pro wrestling, and it's the face paint. You've been wearing the face paint for so long now. You, yeah. You've transitioned into a Dustin Rhodes character in AEW. How important was it to bring that face paint with you to AEW or maybe alter it to whatever personality you were going to portray on camera? So, you know, in WWE being there for so long, like 24 years or whatever, that's all I'd known was the face paint. And before that was just, you know, dusting Dustin trying to find his way in WCW the early days with no paint, just cowboy gear, whatever. Um, so I wanted to kind of do a little Dustin Rhodes one side and, and a throwback to the paint with gold dust. So that's why I chose the half and half. Um, and I thought that was important. I just had to switch up the colors, you know. Well, you know, we all saw you in WCW kind of finding yourself you're always like a, an amazing wrestler amazing performer you know doing the gold dust thing was obviously a, a complete 180 for you you know yeah. what i mean so yeah. when when you're when you're when you're presented with this idea and this is what you're doing you know was there anything that you like was there anything that you did to to sort of get you in that mindset of like this is this is how i want to present him he's going to be this sexualized you know, you know, whatever it was, were you drawing any inspiration from anything? Uh, not really. I was so young, you know, and, you know, being presented with this character, it, um, it had to kind of grow on me. Right. I, I was scared to do certain things and, and, you know, for me personally, and what I've learned over the years is, people that are trying to create something new character wise in the pro wrestling industry, have to want to step out of their comfort zone. And when you step out of your comfort zone, that's usually where the magic happens. Even though it's so uncomfortable, you just don't think you could do it. That's where the magic happens. And it took me a good six months, you know, with this character, knowing he's an androgynous character, complete opposite from what I broke into the business with as Dusty Sun and all this and that. And I was looking for a way to just kind of make um, uh, my name on my own, right? With with this character, and Vince gave me full reigns. He, you know, he didn't have anything negative to say to me ever, man. He just let me play with it and tweak it and get it to where it needed to be. And it took like six, seven months, right? Because I wasn't getting the reaction that I wanted to get at the beginning of learning how to be a heel for the first time. And I'm painted in this just outrageous. This, this presentation of a character that you know, the world is seeing for the first time way before it's time. Yes, yes. I was scared to step over the line, right? And when I did that, they responded like crazy. And it was that easy. And it was just me stepping over into the unknown that made this thing work. And then once I did that, I'm like, okay, that wasn't so bad. I can do this now. I can play this character. I can play this movie part. Um, and did it. We ran with it. And, you know, the over the years, the, the character evolved so so much. And we did so many great things with it. And now the character Goldust is just this gay icon in, in the world of pro wrestling, right? So it's like I made a pretty good name for myself there with, with the character and did it, and did it justice and did it well. I thought leaving there and coming back into my full circle, one last ride, which has been my thing is, you know, how can I take this to the next level and utilize, you know, the, the paint 
and the old natural Dustin Rhodes character. And, you know, right now I would, I would definitely say I'm having probably, and they're few and far between, but I'm having probably the best matches I've ever had in my career. And it's, it's fun. It got fun again. I found my passion again, because sometimes we get a little complacent up there when you're not being utilized or whatever, and you don't understand why. And you just want to be pushed to the moon, but it's, it's not always about me or anybody else for that matter. And it's a, it's a patience game. And it took me a little long. It took, took me a long time to figure that out. And now that I have, that's what I can share with the youngins and the young kids today. They're really chomping at the bit and they're frustrated and they don't understand why they're not getting pushed to the moon. And they might be the best damn workers on the planet. There's just not enough time on a television show to put you all in at once. And it is what it is. And Tony does his best with putting the people on and getting them, you know, some television recognition. It's just, it's, it's changed dramatically over the years. Well, one of the things I, I'm sorry to cut off Dennis, but I, something that you said to me was super interesting. How you talked about how the gold disc character, which was, was ahead of its time. And the reason why I identified with it is because it was so, it was on 10, right? When did you have that moment doing the character where you was like, where you were like, first of all, made the realization like, shit, this is ahead of its time. And uh, I'm doing something now that uh, maybe you didn't realize at the time, but maybe I'm doing something now that's going to be looked at look back as it being ahead of its time if that makes sense yep so it happened in madison square garden and it happened in 1996 i think and i was wrestling sabio big and we've been doing a, you know house show loops for weeks and i think months and just getting my bearings trying to figure out the heel work and, and the character and stuff like that and every night he would want me to do a certain thing and i would say no i can't i just can't do that because I was scared. I was scared to cross the line. Yeah. And this is back when Vince used to go to the the house shows and just be a fan at the curtain and watch the shows and see who was getting reactions, see who was getting the responses from the crowd and things like that. Um, and he was there and I was like, oh God, Savio, and we're in the garden. I mean, this is the Mecca, <laughs> Puerto Rico. He's Puerto Rican. I mean, you know, the, the Puerto Rican population in New York is like very high. And 1996, it's crazy. And, you know, it was as simple as, okay, I'm going to do this tonight. And so I go out there and, yeah, I'm scared to death. And we get to the point of the match where I'm going to do this thing, which is basically just go behind him and rub up and down his chest. He turns around and he charges me and I just bail out of the ring. That simple. But the rubbing up the chest part is what really pissed off the fans. Oh, yeah. And I was scared to death of that, right? Because I, I don't want to portray this, I don't know, this something that I'm not. But that's show business. That's 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 what brings out characters and makes them really, really good or really, really shitty. And as soon as I heard that response from the New York crowd, and they're ruthless, it was like, holy shit. I just tapped into something that I thought I couldn't do. And I stepped over the line. It worked. And I'm just looking. And they're, they're yelling every kind of a obscene thing to me possible, throwing stuff. And they had to make an announcement. Stop throwing stuff or you'll be ejected, you know. And they're still throwing shit. And I'm just like dodging, <laughs> weeping. And I roll back in the ring and Sabu's in the corner and he's, uh, he's, he's just laughing, right? And I'm like, what the fuck are you laughing at? And we locked back up and he said, and I said, what are you laughing at? He said, see how easy that was? Now watch, I'm going to make you do one more thing. And I'm like, okay. So I pushed him back to the corner. He said, turn around and rub your ass in my crotch area. <laughs> so I did it, right? I, I turned around and I just, you know, made these facial expressions, these weird ass facial expressions. And he charged me again and I rolled out again. The rest was history. Yeah. From that point on, it you know, gold dust became gold dust, and I kind of found the character that night, and it, it was it was freaking cool. And they had a, a really nice run for, for a while. 
you know, at the end of your last answer, when you were talking about getting uh, your passion back, which kind of led into my next question is you talk a lot about your recovery and very proud of it. But I've never actually heard you talk about when you actually got your passion for pro wrestling back during that time. Do you kind of have that? I, I miss the industry moment during your recovery, or was that something that maybe didn't leave or came after? It, it came after because, and you know, I don't want to go like too, too in depth on it because yeah, I could talk all day about this, but you know, my recovery had to come first. And of course, in the back of my head, I'm worried about, well, how am I going to survive? You know, when they tell me, I can't go get a job. I can't do this. The recovery comes first. And it really did. And, and my wife, she basically took the reins and she supported us while I was getting better. And it took a couple of years of me going to meetings every night and just trying to get my shit together and not thinking about the wrestling industry, just thinking about the things that I needed to patch up in my life and, and fix and get to that next level of where it needed to be, you know, and then being rehired by WWE. Um, and starting to kind of get into it again, scared to death that I could not do this without some kind of altering substance in my body, scared to death. I, I, it was like, am I going to be able to have this a good match without something in my body? And I did. And was like, OK, that wasn't so bad. And, you know, then you go on and you go on and you go on. And then, you know, like so many before me. You just lose sight of having to be patient about things. You know, you don't see an end in sight. And I finally just had enough. And it was time for me to go in, uh, out of WWE and into a match with my brother at, you know, the first Double or Nothing. And that moment, that night is where I found my passion again. Scared, pretty, pretty nervous about it, you know, because I had not worked for about six months. And... It, <sighs> He's young. Everybody's so much faster and quicker. You know, I'm older, you know, and, and, but Cody's a lot like me with his style of telling a story and, you know, just taking your time and letting things uh, kind of gradually, what's the word for it? Uh, organically kind of just present itself to the people in a story story setting and the story was there because we'd wanted a match for so many years and i told people about it you know i was pissed i wanted this match and i was told it was not good enough to be on the card at wrestlemania and i'm just like man and we proved them wrong but that night i found my passion again and you know it's it's dad's death it's it's a lot of a lot of contributors you know it's my sobriety it, it was all the things that the bad times that i had had that kind of knocked me down a peg and you know i had to find it again and i have and it's good i've kind of slowly gained my life back since 2008 and you know we're going on uh next month is will be 15 years clean and sober so it's and i i don't i don't want to go back there you know because that was all dangerous i mean this devil's right here on my shoulder and all i gotta do is turn around and go for a walk with him and i'll be right back or worse, in jail, some institution, or dead. And I don't want that, you know, because I can't just have one beer or one pill or anything else. So I got to stay away from it all. And, you know, you find an, a new addiction in, like, the gym. And I'm not a bodybuilder, but I go to the gym because it keeps my mind right. I need to keep moving. And that's where the whole thing, uh, keep stepping, came in because my dad would call me every single day after rehab. And he would say those words. So now I say it constantly and it just helps me get through the, you know, the one day, one minute, sometimes at a time and know that it's okay. If I have a bad day, I'm doing it just fine right now. So, and you know, yes, I do understand uh, 30 years in May. So um, Fuck yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting thing that we're talking about because I don't normally don't really, you know, I, I, I practice the anonymous side. But yeah. finding, you know, I think for us as performers, and I wanted to get your opinion on this, uh, because, you know, there's a few wrestlers left that are doing it that are able to tell these stories 
and they have a certain level of grit, right? And I think mm -hmm. that the newer generation, you know, it, it's not that I don't think that they have it. I just think it's a different kind, right? So in your perception of modern day wrestling, and you said it's a lot quicker and, and you know, maybe less on the storytelling side. It's more, it's more spots and ooh, big ooh ahs maybe. I don't know what your opinion is. But yep, do, you, do you feel that today's modern wrestling is something that's going to be able to carry it on for the next decade, the next couple decades? Because like it's kind of like, where do we go from here? So with AEW specifically, we have all kinds of styles, right? And I'm a storyteller side. I will tell a story in five minutes if I have to and do my best story that I possibly can in the time allotted you know it's hard when you're given uh, just a small amount of time but that's the nature of television now yeah I mean there are fans that like the high flying stuff and stuff like that right and all the flips and things like that and every once in a while I'll do something stupid and crazy but I think it adds to my hey man this guy's 53 years old how is he doing that and that keeps me going just a little bit more. So I throw in some of those stuff with my storytelling. And I always say this to the new, the, the, the newer generation of kids is without the old school of thinking and ways and the basics and how we did it back in the day and how they did it before me, dad's era and all that stuff, there is no new school. You, you just can't jump into the new school without some kind, some form of storytelling and what, what brought you into the business, right? So I think there's a place for storytelling. And me personally, I think a long storytelling really pays off in the end. You know, you have a few week storylines that are just two or three or, or a month and that's fine. But I'm into the longer kind of storylines and those are few and far between for me anymore. And that's okay because I'm coming up on the end of my career. So it's I'm just kind of having fun now. But to watch these kids go out there, I think the business is great, but it has grown so much. And I remember Vince McMahon always saying this to me, and he said this to me more than once. It was, look, the business is going to change. You're on the train or you're not on the train. It's going to keep going and you got to grow with it, but you've got to get off the train because that's what that's where it is right now. It's grown like crazy since the Attitude Era, since the days of old, you know, the uh, rock and roll era. Since the uh, the eighties, uh, the uh, Turner era, and all the you know Jim Crockett promotions, and all those days, it's it's changed. But what the fans still love is a story. Mm -hmm. And if you can make one person that is not a believer on that front row, and there's always one, he's just there with their kids, right? And their kids are excited to be there, but they're not. I will find that person and work that one person. If I get a reaction out of that one person at the end of the match, he's standing on his feet. I've done my job right because I know everybody else in the building's there. It's making somebody feel something, right? Mm -hmm. This is the television industry. This isn't the independents. And the independents are great for up and comers that are trying to make their name and, and work in front of people. And that's great. They need to do that. My students from Road Wrestling Academy, I tell them, go get some work. Then we get you to AEW. We try to get you on dark and things like that and get a feeling of television because that's all I've done for so many years, except for 87, 88. Um, and I teach them for television. And it's important to know where your cameras are. It's important to feed your cameras. I mean, that, that, that camera's always trying to see reactions and stuff and when you're facing the crowd in the building and i'll say this to them too the people in the building are great they're, they're our fans we love them we love to have them but you need to be looking at that camera when you're when you're selling when you're in pain when you're happy whatever it is you need to be looking at that camera because that's where your money's at and it's very important to stay in tune with that and not focus so much on your surroundings in the arena you listen to them and respond, always respond to the television. That's where your money is. I don't know if I answered the question. I kind of went in a roundabout way. Okay. Well, you know, uh, I have a question and I'm going to try yep. to formulate it as I talk to you, but uh, 
both of us, Lars and I being you know, WCW guys growing up, watching you, watching your dad, uh, it seems like once every few years, this video pops up of your dad playing basketball and yeah. his absolute athleticism that he had. But for whatever reason, in a lot of his televised matches, he doesn't show his athleticism. And uh, how different do you think his career would have been if he was able to show? Because if you haven't seen that basketball video, people out there watching this, uh, I mean, Dusty is balling. He, uh, Lars, have you seen this video? I have. Okay. I mean, he looks yeah. like. Yeah. He is a three point at the buzzer, man. It's just crazy how. And, you know, me and Cody, when he was a young boy, we would play horse in the in the driveway. He always kicked our ass. Always. <laughs> kicked our ass. I mean, he'd just dump them all day long. And I'm just looking at him. And I'm like, what in the holy dog fuck was that? <laughs> yes. Um, his, his athleticism. And here's another thing, you know, it's great to be. We have great athletes in the business, right? You look at Shelton Benjamin, one of the oh, yeah. greatest in the business, right? You look at Brock Lesnar. That's not going to take you as far as you want to go. You need charisma. And that's what dad had. Dad wasn't ever known for being one of the best workers in the business, but he was a damn good talker. He's one of the best talkers in the business. And he brought the people in and he had charisma. So he made them feel something on a, on a level that I can't uh, understand. You know, it's, it's amazing to watch him, you know, some of the old tapes and just how loud the buildings were back then when he would shake his ass and just throw up the elbow and just walk kind of weird or whatever. That was just him being sassy and his, his charisma. And if you don't have charisma in the wrestling industry, you're dead in the water. And I'm sure for Lars, if you don't have charisma on stage playing or singing or, or you know, music and dancing around and doing all that things, I would think it's probably th the same there, too, unless they just love the fucking song. Right. And well, it, you need you, need, you, def you need that connection like you're talking about. You need that. Yeah. connection. You got to have connection with the fans, no matter what business it is. Or, or you're only going to go so far, in my opinion. Well, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask, and I don't know if this is something, you know, psychologically that you just did or if it was just intuitive, but, you know, and I just will say that I saw your dad uh, when it was, in, it, was a, it was the Road Warriors and your dad versus, like, I think it was the Russians. It was Great American Bash on tour in, in 1986 when he mm -hmm. went out and shook his ass and did the, that was the biggest, it was just nuts, you know. Um, and then the, you know, this whole thing. Well, anyways, every time, and especially in the early days for you, when there was a beef, like, and a legitimate, whether you were in a cage, war games, whatever it was, when that boot came off and you used it as, as a weapon on your fist, I always thought to myself, and you did it in, 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 in I think it was a war games, and you did it very early when you got into the ring. And mm -hmm. I thought to myself, he now he's going to have to wrestle. And I, I, I literally was like, well, where's his shoe? Where's where's the shoe? Like he's wrestling with one shoe on. And then then like as I'm going back, because I used to be a tape trader. Right. And so I've, yeah. the the amount of wrestling that I've consumed in my life, I've probably forgotten more than I remembered. But your dad did the same kind of shit. Take off his cowboy boot, use it, put it on his fist, punch. So was that like a psychological thing that you were trying to do? Were you trying? I mean. Was that even, were you even cognizant that you were doing that? Or were you just, what was that? Because, and then you got to wrestle the rest of the match with one fucking boot. So I'm just wondering, like, I, if you were. Like, I think that was, was, I think that was with Arn in the war games when I took it off. And we had a pretty good little uh, rivalry there um, with Arn. And he's one of my teachers, man. And he may have suggested it. I really don't remember. And it could have been just off the cuff, but. It was like, you know, you just keep going. I wasn't, we weren't high flying and jumping off the ropes and stuff because that cage was pretty low. Right. Uh, the, the war games cage. So it's just a lot of fighting and hitting the ropes or whatever. So, you know, just being on one boot, it didn't bother me. I didn't think about it. But I think those, those instances like that where there's not a DQ, you got to utilize those things. It's like the old bunkhouse matches. You take off right. your boot, use your tape fist, you wrap a chain and you, you know, get the bull rope out under the ring and, you know, things like that. Hit them with the cowbell. 
they pop for those things and they like those things. And, you know, the old Westerns and the old Cowboys, you know, uh, kicking the shit out of each other. And they, it's just a, a real kind of feel fight. Right. Well, my, st- my, yeah. My point, my, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but you, it wasn't the first time that you did it. It's what I'm saying is like, you would do that. And I saw you do it a few times, but it elevated it. It elevated that match. It elevated the, the anger and the intensity. And it was just the simple thing of taking off your freaking shoe, putting it on your fist and hitting a guy like. So back then, right. I was doing nothing but listening. Okay. So I probably wasn't doing too much on my own. Mm. It's like I said, it was Barry. It was Bobby Eaton. It was Arn. It was Ricky Steamboat. Those guys, those men were my teachers and I shut up and listened. And whatever Arn told me or Bobby Eaton or, or Barry, I just did. And I watched and I learned and, you know, um, improvising things every once in a while. I remember the first time I improvised something with Arn Anderson and then I apologized to him in the back afterwards. He said, what are you apologizing for? That was the best thing you could have done. That was great. And you thought outside for, for your own for one second. Right. So start, start getting it. But it takes time and it's very important to listen to your teachers. And I think we've lost sight of that these days. You know, there's there's a few of us left <clears throat> and those few are here in, in AEW. And we got a knowledge, a wealth of knowledge in our at our fingertips. And some people ask and, and ask for, you know, stuff. A lot of them do. And then a lot of them don't. And that's OK. You go out there, do your thing, man, whatever. If you want my help. That's fine too. I'm going to help you. I'm not going to make you look like shit. You know, I, I look at both sides and I make sure what needs to be done and we kind of build from there. It's how I do my coaching. Um, the pulling off the boot was always fun. Right. And I always love taping my fists up for those kind of matches. And I did it like a boxer where I'd go between the fingers and I just yeah. get into it and it makes you makes you hungry and passionate for it. And you're loving what you're doing. You're in this prime spot. And the 92 war games was probably the best one ever. And I loved it. The stinging squadron and dangerous Alliance, dangerous Alliance was, oh, it's money, man. It was so much fun. You talk about your 2023. Very interesting. Uh, breaking a lot of hearts, especially mine and Lars. Uh, when you announced it, we, we, I mean, not a month goes by that we don't talk about your last ride that you've talked about. Dangerous in wrestling to announce uh, maybe like something like that because they always say never say never, or especially in wrestling, never announce a retirement. How, and I'm very sure it's very thought out, but how definite is this move for you in your career? Is this like, eh, I'm transitioning maybe to a part-time deal after 2023. Are you done, done? Uh, don't break my heart. This is me as a fan, not me as a podcaster. Don't break my heart here. Okay. I want so, you to go forever, by the way. <laughs> shit. So. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 35 years in the business, right? I have literally wrestled every everybody i've done so many great things the one person i wish i could have worked with and did not get a chance was randy savage oh, I've worked wow. everybody else everybody and mm. i've had a great career and when you were 35 years in the business and you're you're working pretty steadily on television basis for so long your body takes a toll and I've had a lot of surgeries. My knees are getting bad, and it may be me saying, hey, man, maybe enough's enough. But to, to answer you, um, honestly, I don't know. So um, could I uh, sign another contract at the end of this, this term here with uh, Tony and go on maybe less matches? You know, a few and far between some special, special things that come along down the pipe. Yes. Could I do it 365 days anymore? No, I couldn't. But we don't do that anymore. So it's mm-hmm. it's changed dramatically over the years. It's not like the olden days in WWWF when we're on the road 60 days, of, you know, in a row. And then you come home for three and you're back out for 30. It, it was a crazy time schedule back then. And it's a lot 
there's a lot more time home now and still love the business. So it hasn't left me yet. So I can't really say, Hey man, this is, this might be it. Um, I have been thinking about it, but I want to see what the next step is. And we're just not there yet. I'm still having fun. And every match that I have now that Tony puts me in, I'm like, man, my knees are hurting right now. And here's the one thing that I don't want to happen. The older I get at being 53, if I go out there and stumble and they see it, then they're going to call for my retirement. And it, I don't want to embarrass myself. And I think probably the, the other men and, you know, in this business, my age will probably think the same thing. No matter how confident we are in our thing, I think the older you get, the more wise you are to things and, and wanting to do things in the smart way and not the hard way anymore. But you love the business so much that you go out there and you give it your all. And I think I've always given my all every time I've been in the ring. And that's what's kept the fan base, you know, to a, a pretty good level for me. And they still kind of enjoy me and enjoy my wrestling. And that's a testament to my work rate and ability, not ever winning the world championship. And yes, I want that. But right now at this point, it's probably too late. And I, I would say it is too late and I don't need it. So what else can I do besides pass on my knowledge to the kids? Um, but I'm still passionate about it. And, and I think it's not there yet. So I'm hoping, you know, I can just tell you that I hope maybe this will continue on another couple of years. Maybe not. I, we'll just have to see where it goes when it when that time comes. Well, one of the things, and I know that you know, you know that I have this, and so I'm going to show it to you, though. And that's you and your brother and one of my favorite tag teams of all time that literally lasted yeah. probably a cup of coffee, but it was a rebirth I saw, you know, for your career. It was like, it made me, it's like those moments when you fall in love with wrestling again. And then, you know, to crescendo with him, you know, in AEW and have probably, I would say, I, in my top 10 matches, easily is you and Cody, right? And that the your whole path, I mean, you, it's each one of you, Rhodes brothers or fathers, have a storied, layered wrestling history i mean yeah why hasn't there been a fucking book well i've had the one book yeah right but like a now book of like because i mean a I'm, lot has is, is happened i'm planning on it actually and i think the chapters will be about my uh greatest rivalries greatest matches and go into a story about each of those and um, but this one, I want to be a little longer book and I am, it is in the works. I just have not, I got to sit down with my publicist lady and we got to start talking about it and actually just bite the bullet and, and put it out there. Um, but I definitely do that because there is such a, a difference in all three of us over the years. And you see the transitions and the Rhodes family is such a a powerful name in the wrestling industry. And it is one of the Royal families, like the hearts, the man's the, you know, and uh, I take that to heart and just to sit back now and watch Cody in his turn in his prime. I mean, kicking ass and taking names. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm a little jealous. He's doing such a great job at that. That's just the brotherly uh, competition between us. Quit it. Well, this is the book that you're talking about. Crossroads, right. yeah. Yes. So, and th it was a great read, but what I, what I really want is what you're talking about. Like, I know that there was some, you know, there's things that were touched, but, you know, it's just like, there's so much more. It's like another lifetime, if you don't mind me saying, after that. Does that make sense? Yes. And th yeah. that's, that. And, and there was also things that, you know, anyways, uh, enough hero worshiping. I digress. Uh I appreciate it. And there is there is one in the works, I promise cool. you. So it's a matter of uh me sitting down with the ghostwriter and, and putting it to putting it to paper. I I'm I, not gonna write it down because I just, you know, I'm people wouldn't be able to understand it. My grammatical errors will be all over the page. 
I know we could be doing this for nine more hours with you and you have a grandbaby to get to and we each have one more question. And yeah, I'm not sure if I have so much of a question as much as that observation that it seems like crowds in 2023 when you come out uh, have this much more different reaction than they've had over your career. Almost like they finally get you, like they get Dustin Rhodes, not the son of Dusty, not, you know, Cody's brother, but they get Dustin. Is that the feeling you get now when you come out and you hear the pop for yourself? Because it's very uh, like as fans, podcasters, we're very in tune to this kind of stuff. At least I think I am. And I think Lars thinks he is maybe. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but have you noticed that 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 pop is different for you now? I think it's a we we all love Dustin Pop, right? Uh, Dustin has earned this. We all yeah. love him. We're here with him on that that last ride. I'm not too keen, and and I was at the beginning on my music because it kind of it it it's a slow starter. It's not one of those like the gold dust chimes, man. Bam, and it hits, yeah. pops. It's a slow pop when it starts breaking into and, and it was kind of off a of brain stew with green day and they just kind of switched their ruckus you know played with it a little bit i would love you to make me something really cool that's catchy and bam pops right to shoot it would be I've, so cool you know, for my last year or whatever i've got something for you bro that is gonna i mean i know that we like the same kinds of music and i know that you know Rock and roll is deep there. I got something for you. I, I'll, I'm going to send it to you, and then you can tell me if you like it. How about that? Of course. It's already got bass, drums, guitars. There's just no vocals on it yet, but I think it would be sure. perfect for you. That's awesome, man. Um, the fans today, I think, you know, and me being, you know, as old as I am, um, they're still there for me. They haven't faltered. And, you know, the, the more I'm on TV, the better it is, uh, you know, and that music is is a slow starter, but then it kicks up. And then when I walk out, they're there. They, it's a slow rise. And I like that. It's not the immediate pop, which I like, too. And, you know, the 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 music where everybody's singing now, it seems to be the, the new trend where everybody sings the song. Like Cody's song, you know, Down Straight's uh, song, like uh, Ruby's song, like, yeah, um, Jericho's, you know, just stuff like that. Everybody's like singing along. it, And that's good for the fans because that's what we need to do is, is get them involved and make them involved because then you get over and your character gets over and then you're on TV more. Do I need that? No, not necessarily. But, yeah, it would be kind of cool to have a, you know, that music. I'm big into westerns, you know, where it starts with the uh, wah, wah, wah. You know that song I'm talking about? Or that oh, music? Yeah. I don't know if that's something we could do at the beginning because that's kind of cool to me. It's it's different than uh, Adam Page's because right. he's got one that's pretty cool. But I've always wanted to do that little that little whistle right before I came out, you know? Yeah. Like the sp the old spaghetti western Clint Eastwood shit, man. Yeah, we somehow make magic happen a lot on this podcast. <laughs> you got to tell well, him that we can't change his name to Ruby Riot. <laughs> Green and spray painting everybody. <laughs> well, Lars you know, my last question. I mean, uh, Dustin, I I seriously, honestly wish I had you for a couple hours because there's so much stuff, but um. You know, I started thinking about everything that you've done and still how you've stayed so relevant. And it's like, you know, guys who did these types of gimmicks, you know, starting with you, you know, you basically two careers, Dustin Rhodes, the cowboy kind of baby face, and then Gold Dust, the androgynous heel. And like we were talking about earlier, the polar opposites. And you think, think about guys like uh, Adrian Adonis or Adrian Street, or, yeah. you know, the honky tonk man before he was the honky tonk man and had more of a punk rock thing when in the Memphis and the, and just just tap it into the to the psyche like the, the those types of things. Um, now, as you're sitting here and I know I wanted to I really wanted to talk about you and Swerve because that's some of the best stuff that I've seen in a long time on TV. 
And we're talking about a guy who's probably half your age, right? But there's this yeah. chemistry between the two of you that was just so undeniable. And, uh, you know, and I know that you talked about Macho Man and wishing to get in the ring, but now you got like a guy like Swerve that you've been working with. But the I, I, I mean, so much to say. The Elusive World yeah. Heavyweight Championship. The Elusive World Heavyweight Championship for Dustin Rhodes. Like, is that a goal? Is that a goal for this last ride? It's always been a goal, right? Whether or not anybody thinks um, I'm good for that spot, that's another issue because I don't really know what's in uh, Tony's brain as far as, man, Dustin needs to be world champion. Do I need it? Absolutely not. Do I want it? Selfishly? Yes. Um, how long I would carry it? Probably a week. But just to even be the world champion would just really cement my legacy, and that would be cool. Even a TNT title, you know. Um, but I've gone so long without it, and I've only had these, you know, mid-card titles like the Intercontinental United States and all the tag team championships and things like that. It would be cool. Definitely cool, and I would take it. I would take it. Uh, that's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure on somebody, and MJF is doing a freaking outstanding job. Absolutely. He is he is an unbelievable talker, and he can talk just off the cuff all day about, you know, and just will put you down all day. He's amazing at, at the things that come out of his mouth, and those people come along once in a blue moon, and he has it, and he's going to he's going to be, like, much bigger than he is right now. And there's so many of the kids there right now that are going to be there. And, hey, man, the world title, it's, you know, there's always the the NWA world title. But you know what? It's lost some of his prestige, in my opinion. Mm. That uh, NWA is not like the old NWA. And it would be cool to have because Cody had it. My dad had it. And if oh, I had yeah. it, first family to all have the, the NWA world title, the same belt. Mm. That would be cool. Um, I'm not sure if it's a goal anymore, though, because of my age. Uh, I don't know if we can end the podcast on a better note than go get that NWA title for us, at least. Yeah, I now, now I want to see that. <laughs> Thanks. Billy Corgan got to pay. <laughs> I'll start a GoFundMe for that Yeah, shit. fuck that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm uh, selling shit right now. I'm like on eBay right now. Let's get Dustin fucking Rhodes, the NWA fell. I'll pay you. Fuck it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, listen, for everybody at home, the podcast over, we're going to geek out with them a few more minutes off the air. Lars Fredrickson, Dennis Farrell, Dustin Rhodes. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. This is dream come true interview for both of us. Thank you guys very much.